Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of Terry Pratchett, A Life with Footnotes by Rob Wilkins. So this is the official biography of Sir Terry Pratchett by Rob Wilkins, who was his uh, sort of PA and assistant. Pratchett being one of my um, favourite of authors of all time, so I knew I had to pick this one up as soon as I saw someone else talking about it. As always, I'm going to read you the blurb. I'm going to share with you the single tab that I have tabbed out for now, and then I'll update this as I go along. So, Dane reads... Sir Terry Pratchett, creator of the phenomenally successful Discord series, was one of the world's best loved and best selling authors. At the time of his death in 2015, he was working on his greatest story yet, his own. It is the story of a boy who, aged six, was told by his head teacher that he would never amount to anything and spent the rest of his life proving him wrong, who walked out on his A-levels to become a journalist, encountering some dead bodies and the idea for his first novel before he reached 20, who celebrated his knighthood for services to literature by forging himself a sword. Tragically, Terry ran out of time to complete the memoir he desperately wanted to write, but now, in the only authorised biography, his literary assistant and friend Rob Wilkins picks up where Terry left off, and with the help of friends, family and Pratchett's own unpublished words, tells the full story of an extraordinary life. So let's check out the tabs. So I love this, there's some information on how popular he was. Um, he sold about 100 million books at the time of writing in 2021. Uh, but it said, it was frequently said that no train anywhere in Britain was permitted to run it until it was established that at least one passenger on board was reading a Terry Pratchett. It was also frequently said that Terry had the honor of being Britain's most shoplifted author, an allegation made lightly on one occasion, which then followed him around forever. No reliable statistics are available in this area, but either way, Terry didn't especially mind. By the time people were in a position to shoplift them, he felt he'd been paid for the books already. Very true. So uh, Terry said that uh, the message of Christ is not really so far from the message of Bill and Ted in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Be excellent to each other. Yeah, that is pretty much. So you get lots of stuff about uh, Pratchett growing up in Beaconsfield, which is just down the road from me. I've actually jogged there and back a few times. Um, and we learn about a time when he met uh, Arthur C. Clarke. So I'm going to read this out. Uh, blah, 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 blah. A handful of years later at a science fiction convention in London, when Terry, who was there as a fan, found himself next to Arthur C. Clarke at the urinals. It brought with it the realization that for all that one might very easily form grander ideas about them, authors were flesh and blood and moved among us. Indeed, in the case of Arthur C. Clarke, emptied their bladders out alongside us. And if that were the case, then perhaps it wasn't so outlandish in the long run to believe that one might oneself even become an author. We get a Chesterton quote, which is very famous. Um, and it does, it sounds like Pratchett could have written it. The objection to fairy stories is that they tell children there are dragons, Chesterton wrote, in sentences that from this end of the telescope can look highly Pratchett-like. But children have always known there are dragons. Fairy stories tell children that dragons can be killed. We get a reference to the cottage bookshop down the road from home in the village of Penn. Um, I've been there, it is sadly no longer there, but it is literally a cottage that was a, a full bookshop. A uh, full second-hand bookshop. I think they had like something like 120,000 books or something. But yes, it's um, sadly since closed down. And we get this little line about um, Frogmore and High Wycombe. That's literally like, what, a two-minute walk from here? Three-minute walk? I walked through Frogmore to get to town and town's five, ten minutes away. Uh, there, and also in the little library, it's at Terry's second major discovery in this line, and a place which barely qualified as a shop, and certainly not as a library, being just a wooden shack on an as yet unrestored bomb site in the Frogmore district of High Wycombe. One afternoon after school, aged around 13 and with his school satchel still slung over his shoulder, Terry boldly parted this ostensibly unpromising establishment's beaded curtains and ended with him. Interestingly enough, there's now a, the Frogmore is where the Air Raid Cafe is, uh, which is a World War II themed um, cafe, so I wonder if that's where the bomb site was. So Pratchett said it's hard to read a lot of science fiction and be a bigot, and I think he had a point there. And we also learned that he went to Wickham Technical High School, and again, I live in High Wickham. So we get this, which is cool, I'm just going to read it first. Um, he was obliged with the rest of his year to participate in cross-country running. Here, he would contentedly adopt a position at the back of the pack with a friend, Mick Rowe, and as they jogged compliantly but uncompetitively round the boating stream and into the woods of Wickham Rye, engage in lively conversation and observations about their surroundings. Um, that's where I do park running. We get a little bit about Arthur C. Clarke being teetotal, which is cool because I also do not drink. And a reference to uh, lead vocals and harmonica played in a band called the Belly Flops. They were a skiffle group. Uh, that was played by Michael Moorcock, very cool. And here we get some stuff about Roald Dahl, which is very cool. Because um, again, another local author, Dahl lived in Great Missenden. So uh, he was writing under the, the pen name Marcus here as well. Um, 
And there was the time that Marcus took himself off to interview local author Roald Dahl. By then, Dahl had published Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and James and the Giant Peach, but he was still some way from becoming a household name, to the point that Terry found it necessary to introduce him as follows. For 15 years, Roald Dahl has lived and written in Great Missenden, but to the British public, he is probably better known as the husband of actress Patricia Neal, or as the writer of the screenplays for the James Bond film, You Only Live Twice. Hard work, but great fun, he said, and the spectacular Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. And we get this, which is cool, because I used to live on this same road. Um, in due course, they found a flat to rent cheaply on the ground floor of an Edwardian house on Amersham Hill in High Wycombe, moving in along with a growing collection of tortoises who also commuted. And yeah, so, I, you know, probably not the same house that I lived in, but still very cool. We talk about one of his later houses, and this was cool, as I'm a big Red Dwarf fan. Uh, there was much more room for overnight guests too. Upstairs was what would eventually become the Craig Charles Memorial Suite after a weekend when the Red Dwarf actor came to dinner and ended up staying over. And here we learn a little bit about his uh, writing process, which is fascinating to anyone of a writerly persuasion. Uh, let's see. Writing a novel was setting out on a journey from one side of the Valley of Clouds to the other. The valley down below you was full of mist, but with any look, you could see the other side of it from where you were. And you could also see quite clearly, just above the valley's mist, the tops of one or two trees or other prominent landmarks. So the job was to set off in the direction of one of those landmarks, to descend into the mist and see what became visible to you along the way, but always with a view to emerging at the point you'd chosen on the other side. To that end, Terry often found it useful to write the final scenes of a proposed book first, or at least to write down straight away the scene on the other side of the valley as he saw it at the point of departure. That might not be where the journey actually ended up, but those words could be rearranged or adapted if necessary, or even taken out altogether having served their purpose, which was just to give the journey a sense of direction at the outset. People frequently speak of having had a great idea for the start of a novel. Terry knew that the art to it, and almost certainly the more difficult bit, was having a great idea for the end of a novel. And having got that destination fixed, more or less, he was ready to walk off down into the mist. From that point on, as witnessed from beside him at the keyboard, the entire process could appear to be an act of improvisation, except that many of the things that happened along the way during the journey to the other side of the valley, and that turned into the novel's key scenes and incidents, would have been gestating in his mind for weeks, months, and even years beforehand. And so this is quite fun as well, it's very Pratchett. Uh, he'd ask somebody called Pat, he'd ask uh, how much talk the average human would need to generate to tear the head off another average human. Pat's conclusion on the latter was that no average human could do so. But it's an orc that's going to be doing it, said Terry. Pat thought about this. You're inventing an orc, Terry, so really, whatever you write is going to be the right answer. But I want it to be the right, right answer, said Terry. I thought this was really interesting because this talks about being paid per word, which is something that, you know, all writers have to come to terms with eventually. It's one of the many ways I can charge my clients. Um, we get this. Um, Terry was in receipt of a request to write a short essay for the brochure of a prestigious tech company. It was a sort of commercial work he would normally have declined, but this pitch had got his attention and the old mentality of the freelance journalist had kicked in. They're offering to pay eight pound per word, Terry said in disbelief. I think this may be too good to turn down. I agreed with him that it was an extremely generous rate of pay, worth setting aside the time for, but then I thought about it. Wait though, how much are you getting per word for writing this novel? I don't know, said Terry. How much am I getting per word? It wasn't a difficult sum, yet the mentality of the novelist being somehow separate from the mentality of the freelance journalist, it wasn't a sum that it had ever occurred to Terry to do, up to now. This then was the maths. Terry was receiving £1 million for each novel. Each novel was 100,000 words long. Therefore, he was being paid as a novelist at the rate of £10 per word. The offer of the company brochure, at £8 per word, was politely declined on the grounds that it would not have been an economical use of Terry's time. Wow, imagine earning that much. Ah, uh, this is a fun bit. He meets a celebrity. Uh, I was once in a position in Dublin to introduce him to Bono from U2, explaining, as I did so, that Bono owned the hotel we were standing in. Ah, good, Terry said to Bono. Can you get me a milkshake? Which he did. Here we get um, Terry's reaction when someone tried to hug him. To understand in full the remarkable dimension of this moment, one needs to know that Terry was by no means a hugger. Indeed, at the point at which this unprecedented interaction happened, he may well have been among the least tactile people on the planet. I still wince to recall the moment at one of the Discord conventions when Terry was sitting with some others around a table and an attendee came up behind his chair and casually began to give him a shoulder massage. Awkward does not begin to describe the ensuing seconds as Terry, rendered seemingly numb from scalp to toenails by this moment of overfamiliarity, sat very still and waited for it to end. When people, not least in the world of film and television, made the mistake of going in for a hug with Terry and I was nearby, Terry would hold up a hand and say, Rob does my hugging for me. 
Hugging was simply not in Terry's repertoire. And it, it gets harder to read later on as we learn more about his struggle with Alzheimer's. Um, so here's a little bit of a passage that kind of gives you a feel for what that's like. He misbuttoned his shirts a couple of times. He came into the chapel one morning with his t-shirt on inside out. He came in on another on inside out and back to front. But even then, these levels of distractedness were not completely out of character, and especially not when there was a book being written, which was pretty much all of the time. This was one of the problems for amateur diagnosis in this case. Forgetfulness, preoccupation, being present and yet almost entirely absent at the same time, insufficient attention to t-shirts, buttons, inanimate objects and other people. So many of the indications of early onset Alzheimer's turned out also to be the indications of full-blown orthodom. And in any case, the rest of the time he was completely fine, wasn't he? But then there was the day that Terry arrived in the chapel and told me about a noise he could hear in the house. It had cost him a few broken nights, he said, and he'd been all over every room and he couldn't locate it. Would I come down and help him look for it? I assumed it would be a smoke alarm or a clock or something, a battery that needed replacing somewhere. We went down to the house and stood in the kitchen listening. Terry was facing me, Terry was facing me but gesturing behind him. Can you hear it? He said. I couldn't hear anything. We went and stood on the stairs. Can you hear it now? Asked Terry, again making a vague wave over his shoulder. Still nothing. We went up onto the landing and stood and listened there for a moment. Terry himself seemed to be looking a bit doubtful now. He opened the bedroom door and we went and stood in there. More gesturing. Silence. After a short while, I said, Terry, do you think it's possible that this noise doesn't actually exist? Terry thought about it for a moment. Yes, he said, I think quite possibly it doesn't. We went downstairs and then walked back up to the chapel. Well, that was weird, I said. Wasn't it, said Terry. The noise was never talked about again. And when he does find out he's got Alzheimer's, he says, at least it's me, at least it's not Lynn, his wife. And we get like this little passage. He'd got it sorted, Terry told me one day out of the blue. He'd been talking to a local farmer who had a shotgun. They'd laid out the plan. At the appointed time, Terry would go for a walk and somewhere along the path, the farmer would step quietly out of a bush behind him and shoot him in the back of the head. Painless, easy. And uh, Robert Llewellyn comes along. Um, he's a, 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 a big Pratchett fan which is fascinating because I'm a Terry Pratchett fan. Robert Llewellyn was also in Red Dwarf and I'm, a, as I said, a big Red Dwarf fan. Um, yeah. Uh, one time, uh, Rob said, he asked Robert if he could take a picture of him beside the fridge, which was a bit tacky, I know, but Red Dwarf fans will understand. The fridge was a smeg fridge, which is what well, they use as a, like a curse word in Red Dwarf. But yes, Terry Pratchett, A Life with Footnotes by Rob Wilkins. Um, Definitely harder to read towards the end as, as Pratchett deals with uh, his Alzheimer's diagnosis, but a very like very moving book in general. Um, fascinating autobiography, a must read for any Discworld fan. I would have to say I gave this a 5 out of 5 and it's one of my top books of the year so far. Um, yeah, beautiful, very moving, very sad, very necessary. So there we have it, that's what I made of Terry Pratchett, A Life with Footnotes by Rob Wilkins. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.